Hi everyone, and welcome to my oral presentation for advanced topics in chemical physics. The paper I'm going to be covering is titled Time Resolved Imaging of Purely Valence Electron Dynamics During a Chemical Reaction. This paper was written by P. Hockett, C. Z. Bisgard, O. J. Clarkin, and A. Stolo. At a base level, all chemical reactions are almost entirely governed by the dynamics of valence electrons. If we can understand these dynamics, we can make steps to understanding further the chemical reactions themselves. Let's look closer at what we mean by valence electron dynamics. We can split this concept into two parts. Firstly, valence electrons, which I'm not going to spend much time explaining. Hopefully everyone should know what a valence electron is by now. Secondly, there is dynamics. How does this system evolve with time? This is easy to think of for classical systems, but a little more difficult for quantum mechanical ones. What do dynamics mean for electrons in a molecule? As explained by these two pigeons, the most simple way to describe electron dynamics is a change in the electron density of a system with time. During a chemical reaction, these changes in electron density can often occur rapidly, leading to drastic changes in the system of interest. Occasionally, the nuclei of a system will also change positions at a rapid pace, often on a similar timescale to the electron motion. The motion of the nuclei can have a significant effect on the electrons. Uh, we say that the motion of the nuclei is coupled to the motion of the electrons. This makes interpreting the dynamics of the system a lot harder. The Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down due to the coupling of nuclear and electronic motions, so it would be difficult to model theoretically. So, instead of modeling the system theoretically, why don't we actually measure it? To begin with, we will talk about how the development of the energy of the system can be measured with time. Photoelectron pump probe spectroscopy can be used to measure the energy of electrons in the system, which allows us to gain an understanding of the reaction's energetic progress. The emission of a photoelectron depends on photoionization matrix elements, here D of T. These matrix elements take the state formed through the action of the molecule's dipole coupling to the laser electric field and then acting on the original state, and then project that state on all states above the ionization level. Essentially, these matrix elements describe the probability of a molecule ionizing when exposed to a photon of a specific energy. These matrix elements depend on both the nuclear and electronic degrees of freedom, and so largely depend on the reaction progress. Performing photoelectron spectroscopy at different times in the same reaction allows us to gain an idea of how the reaction develops with time. So we call it Time Resolved Photoelectron Spectroscopy, or TRPES. Now, I shouldn't go much further without describing the system that we'll be exploring the dynamics of. Hockett et al. chose to examine the photodissociation of carbon disulfide. The polyatomic molecule is excited from its ground state uh, by a pulse of light of wavelength 201.2 nanometers into an excited state. This excited state quickly dissociates, producing carbon sulfide in its ground state with pi g symmetry, and sulfur in either the singlet or the triplet state. The final state of the sulfur is unimportant for the purposes of this paper, it can be either. This particular reaction is highly non adiabatic with rapid changes occurring in the electron density of the system during this photodissociation. As discussed earlier, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down. Another thing that makes this system interesting, and the reason why it in particular was chosen by Hockett et al, is because it dis displays something which I have decided to call the four C's of polyatomics, four things that, according to Hockett et al, are generic to polyatomic dynamics, namely coupling, of vibrational modes, conical intersections, spin conversion, and photodissociation. Let's take a look at the reaction profile of this system. This diagram, and a few more we'll be looking at, come from a slightly earlier paper written by C.Z. Bisgard et al., which explores the photoelectron spectra of the same reaction from more of an experimentalist point of view while the main paper is more of a theoreticist's viewpoint. The pump photon excites the molecule into an initially linear state. The bandwidth of the pump probe is large enough that 
two vibrational levels are both populated in this excitation. The development of the electrons in this state is measured by the probe photon, uh, here of wavelength 268.3 nanometers, ionizing the molecule and emitting a photoelectron, the trajectory and energy of which is measured. The development of the molecule along the reaction coordinate involves manipulation of the vibrational character. As the molecule proceeds towards dissociation, it gains pi g character, indicated in this graph by the general vibrational coordinate q increasing. The pi g symmetry is accompanied by a development from linear geometry to a bent and stretched geometry. After draining this pi g character, the molecule can either dissociate or oscillate between the two geometries. We'll talk a little bit more about what this change in vibrational character means and how this movement between geometries affects the system. Here's that same reaction profile in a bit more detail as calculated through time-dependent density functional theory. This lets us see in a little bit more detail some of the things I was talking about in the last slide. Firstly, it's worth pointing out that the dissociation to carbon sulfide and sulfur occurs through a conical intersection. Secondly, we can see here majorly contributing orbitals as the dynamics of the system develop. Initially, immediately after being exposed to the pump pulse, the majorly contributing orbital is this one here. At later times, the wave packet develops and the majorly contributing orbital is instead this pi g orbital. These purple lines represent the ionization due to the probe pulse through which we can measure the character of the system. Finally, we can take a look at the axes of this potential energy surface. Horizontally is the stretch of the carbon sulfur bond and vertically is the bend of the polyatomic molecule. As the wave packet develops along this path, we can see that it is simultaneously bending and stretching in these directions. So far, we have discussed how to get time resolved measurements of the electron dynamics by performing pump probe photoelectron spectroscopy at different delay times. Obtaining energy resolved measurements is also relatively simple. The detection process just needs to be able to measure the momentum of detected photoelectrons, which is, you know, fine. However, if we really want to properly measure the dynamics of the reaction, then we also need to consider the angular dependence of the photoelectron emission process. The direction relative to the molecules the electrons are emitted from can inform us on the distribution of the electron density about this molecule in 3D. If we combine that with our other measurements, we can get an idea of the development of the electron density distribution with time. In this case, to get a 3D angle resolved picture of the photoelectron density, the microchannel plate detector used was able to report the X, Y and time of flight data of the measurement. But in order for that to mean anything, there's something else we need to consider. In the lab frame, molecules in a gas will be in random, constantly changing alignments. Measuring the angle resolved data in this case would not tell us any information that we don't already know from the photoelectron spectra, as all the angular dependence is cancelled out by these random orientations. The best comparison I can draw is that it's like gathering an X-ray powder diffraction spectrum. It still contains useful information, but some more useful information is lost. Instead, we need to gather information from the molecular frame. This is like a single crystal X-ray diffraction pattern. To do this, we need the inspected molecules to all be aligned in the same direction for the duration of the pump probe experiments. So, how do we do this? We can achieve transient alignment of the molecules through exposing them to short, intense, non-resonant laser pulses. This excites low-lying rotational energy levels, creating a rotational wave packet which propagates over time in this oscillating pattern shown here. This has been measured using the pump probe's photoelectron yields dependence on time, or this ion yield here. Uh, during the half revival of this wave packet, there is a brief window here shaded in red where the molecules are aligned along the direction of the polarization of the alignment pulse. 
Uh, the other laser pulses used in this experiment should be aligned on this axis too, as of course this will provoke the maximum yield of photoelectrons. Uh, the ion yield is maximized. This transient alignment creates this roughly one picosecond window uh, where the molecules are aligned in the same direction, during which we can make measurements in the molecular frame. A one picosecond window is not really a long time, but it is enough for our purposes here. The carbon disulfide photodissociation reaction takes less than one picosecond to fully complete. And uh, for reference, the specifications of the laser pulse used are given here. If we make our pump probe measurements during this one picosecond window where the molecules share an alignment, then we will be able to resolve much more information about the electron densities in the system. Here the data gathered is presented in 2D as gathered on the microchannel plate detectors. On the left here we can see the result of an angle resolved measurement where the molecules are in a random alignment. Uh, in the middle column is the result of the same measurement during the half revival period uh, where all the molecules share an alignment. And on the right are the majorly contributing orbitals at each stage in the propagation. This pi star orbital here and here and this sigma star orbital here. If we look at the random alignment data we can't see much correlation between the character of these orbitals and the distribution shown here. However the data obtained during the alignment window shows how the photoelectron emission depends on the character of the dominating electron orbitals. The shape of the obtained data seems to match the shape of the dominating orbitals. We call these sets of data TRMFPADs, or Time Resolved Molecular Frame Photoelectron Angular Distributions. Now that we know where it all comes from, let's take a look at the data gathered by Hawkes et al. Here we can see the raw data obtained for the photoelectron spectra. These are the measurements without the angular dependence. Redder regions represent higher photoelectron counts. The x-axis is the pump probe delay time, and the y-axis is the energy of the recovered photoelectrons. A higher energy photoelectron means a lower energy cation left behind. This will become a lot more important relatively soon. These horizontal lines represent energy regions A, B, and C. These are the energy regions that Hockett et al. chose to examine more closely. We'll take a look at that now. But first, I'd like to point out this area in region C, where a slight increase in the photoelectron count becomes visible. The photoelectron spectra for specific energy regions are shown here. The data obtained from the photoelectron spectra can be decomposed into two parts. A bi-exponential part, which is a combination of a fast and slow exponential decay as the disulfide dissociates, and an oscillatory part which is due to the quantum beats of the electron in the excited state. These parts can be fit and decomposed. Here, the beating part is shown in this dashed line, uh, scaled by a factor of five for visibility. As can be seen here, at higher energy ranges, the oscillatory part is increasingly dominant. That slight increase I pointed out in the last slide is just about visible here. At different energy ranges, the cation state that the emission of the photoelectron leaves behind, which governs the photoionization matrix elements, has different vibrational character. At high photoelectron kinetic energies, uh, meaning low cation internal energies, as seen here in region C, the cation is in its ground vibrational state, and the oscillation of the electron has a much stronger effect on the photoelectron spectra. The sensitivity of this spectra to the oscillatory term is lower for higher vibrational states, as the photoionization matrix elements are affected more by this vibrational character than the oscillations, oscillations of the valence electrons. So when there's no vibrational character, it's affected strongly by the oscillations. While this effect is lesser at higher internal energies, regions A and B, it is still present. The shaded regions on these spectra, the blue, the green, and the red, correspond to the time regions during which the angular distributions were examined, which we'll look at now. 
Here we can see the angular distributions recorded at roughly 100, 500 and 900 femtoseconds. In black is the raw data obtained using the X, Y and time of flight data recorded during the experiment. The 3D shapes were obtained by fitting the raw data to an expansion in spherical harmonics. There's a few things to point out. The form and dynamics of the angular di distributions are qualitatively the same for each energy region. The energy densities extrapolated from them can tell us a lot about the dynamics of this system. We can see the character of this wave packet develop over time, visible most clearly for the high energy photoelectrons in region C. There's an oscillating push-pull type interaction happening, with the electron density expanding and contracting along the alignment direction. This is due to that oscillatory term discussed in the previous slide. And, as mentioned when we first looked at the angular distributions, the symmetry of these densities is changing over time too. Initially, the wave packet has sigma character. It develops, gaining pi character, uh, before finally returning to its initial sigma symmetry. This is visible even at high internal energies, and shows how the quantum beating, which is an effect originating entirely from the valence electron, has a real effect on the dynamics of the reaction. Now, let's have a look at how this compares to the theory and how we can use what we've learned from this experiment in the future. It's clear that the angular distributions we've just measured can tell us much about the valence electron dynamics of the system of interest. If we could predict or model these distributions before taking any measurements, we may be able to use this to model different reactions in the system. The most obvious way of modelling the angular distributions is from the ground up. Ab initio methods to model the angular distributions of polyatomic molecules have been performed in the past, notably by Arasaki et al, but they are very difficult. So instead, Hockett et al used symmetry arguments to simplify this calculation, giving a cruder model than ab initio methods would, but at a lot less effort. Let's talk about how to calculate the angular distributions here represented by i of omega phi and t. Theoretically, these can just be given by the square of the photoionization matrix elements d of t. We can expand this expression using spherical harmonics to give the following expression. Here, beta represents the anisotropy parameters, which are really the only things we need to calculate to find the angular distributions themselves. Seems simple. Let's have a look at how to find the anisotropy parameters. Oh, maybe not so simple. I'll briefly cover where this huge expression comes from. This first line describes the polarization of the probe pulse. The second line describes the rotation of the molecule into the molecular frame. And the rest describes the photoelectrons and cations. The time dependence is all contained in the time dependence of the standard wave packet eigenstate expansion coefficients, C of n. Finally, I'd like to point out this last line. These are the radial matrix elements of the system, and this is where the real difficulty in calculation lies. Everything else is just maths. These are the things that we use symmetry to reduce. Using the known symmetry of the system, the 1 sigma u plus symmetry of the excited state and the pi g symmetry of the cation and monosulfite, we can approximate the radial matrix elements and calculate an our anisotropy parameters. If we choose our wave packet coefficient Cn to match the physical problem at hand, we can then cal calculate the angular distributions. In this case, the wave packet coefficients were chosen to model the system shown as in the figure to the right. Two states excited simultaneously, separated by an energy of 33 wave numbers. Here, the symmetry label C represents 1 sigma u plus, the symmetry of the excited state, and likewise, the label X represents the pi G symmetry that we've talked about for the cation. After a fair bit of maths, the angular distributions calculated using the symmetry justified simplifications for the radial matrix elements are shown here. These green 2D outlines show a slice of the angular distributions projected in 3D using the spherical harmonics. We'll look at those in detail in a moment. For now, we can just look at the distributions. We can see how they develop in time and eventually return to their initial state in this oscillating manner. 
Finally, here's what the angular distributions look like projected in 3D. At propagation times of 100 femtoseconds, the angular distribution shows the 1 sigma u plus electronic character. At 500 femtoseconds, the angular distribution shows the pi g electronic character. And at 900 femtoseconds, the 1 sigma u plus electronic distribution has reappeared. This propagation matches what we have discussed previously with the fluctuations along the z-axis. This is easiest to compare to the experimental low internal energy photoelectron angular distributions or in region C here. So to quickly summarize, we've discussed a method of experimentally probing valence electron dynamics using photoelectron spectroscopy and discussed how we may in future use the symmetry of a reaction to predict the valence electron dynamics. If anyone has any questions about anything I've talked about today, feel free to get in touch with me uh, through the provided means to ask. Other than that, thank you all for listening.